Yeah. Okay. Hello, everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Craig Maxwell. I'm one of the co-chairs of the Southern Piedmont chapter of the Native Plant Society, uh, which is what we are, uh, along with my co-chair, Laura Domingo, who's going to jump into the camera here just a little bit. <laughs> uh, thank you all for coming today. I know it's a beautiful day outside, so thank you for spending some time inside with us. Uh, we have Ed Davis here today to speak with us. He is landscape architect and horticultural director for the UNC Charlotte Botanical Gardens. Um, and before we jump into that, we just have a few announcements. Um, so we are the Native Plant Society, the North Carolina Native Plant Society, and we uh, uh, we promote the enjoyment and conservation of North Carolina's native plants and their habitat through education, advocacy, propagation, and protection. Uh, we have a lot of events that we do throughout the year, such as these. We also have some guided hikes. Uh, if, you're, if you're not a member and you're interested in joining, some of those hikes are members only. Some of our events are members only just because of the, um, the locations or the setup. Uh, so we do, like I said, we do guided field trips as well. We do foreign, uh, native foreign newsletters each year, and we have native plant sales throughout the year. Uh, if you have any questions or you're interested, ncwildflower.org is our website where you can find some more information. And with that, I will turn things over to Ed. Thank you, Craig. And uh, thanks all of you for being here. Um, I hope a lot of you have already been out to the botanical gardens and seen our uh, 10 acres. Um, I'm going to be talking about um, uh, one particular part of the, uh, the garden that is uh, only native plants from the Carolinas. Uh, that's the Melichamp Natives uh, Garden. Again, hope that y'all are familiar with it. And uh, I saw somebody slip in that is actually a one of our uh, great volunteers. Uh, we have a volunteer group that helps us maintain uh, the gardens. So um, it's, I, I'll start off by saying it's uh, hard to hard to believe it's been 10 years since we started the gardens. Um, was the site back in 2012 exactly 10 years ago. And um, for those of you who are familiar with the site, you may not have seen, uh, you may not, that may not look familiar at all. I will point out two things uh, to keep your eye on. One is this crepe myrtle, which I didn't, couldn't remove, even though it's not native, and this dwarf white pine. So I'll be showing you pictures and those plants did remain and they'll help give you a reference of uh, how things have changed. Um, there's the white pine there in the center, another view, and then other parts of the site filled with plants, uh, awkward drainage, awkward site, and then it's sloping. Uh, awkward drainage meaning that there was a ditch running right through the center of the gardens that I had to uh, work with. And uh, I was approached, I was helping, I started out uh, working on the project. I was approached by Dr. Melichamp uh, and he said, uh, what do you know about your landscape architect? What do you know about uh, native plants? And I said, well, I, I did a considerable amount of study uh, working with native plants when I was at the University of Georgia getting my landscape architecture degree. And uh, he said, well, would you be interested in helping us design a native garden? So I said, of course I would. Um, so oh, there's a picture of the, the drainage uh, just to show you one of the problems we have to contend with. That comes from our lot five where we had the plant sale, which is a huge parking lot. But that went right down the middle of the, uh, the site. So, um, there's a photograph of Dr. Melichamp, um, and his motiv main motivation was, uh, besides spreading um, knowledge about native plants, at this time, he was uh, beginning to write his book, Native Plants of the Southeast, and we had already at UNCC 
uh, begun a certificate program on um, uh, teaching people more about native plants, how to use native plants in one's home garden. Uh, and this is uh, still a program that continues on today. Uh, and he and Paula Gross, the uh, uh, di assistant director at the time, uh, had this uh, bright idea, great idea, to uh, have a display garden where, uh, as we're teaching these classes, we could actually go and show people uh, a little bit more about a, uh, a planned native garden. We have seven acres that's pretty much natural, but we wanted to transform, they wanted to transform this site into something that would be educational and a place where uh, one could go and learn more about how to use native plant, plants in one's garden. So, um, and so I asked them before when we started, I said, give me some ideas of what you think um, you want to accomplish and give me just sort of a general um, mission statement. Uh, so this is the program, uh, of course, Carolina native flora. It took us a while with flora of the uh, flora of the southeast, and I said, "Well, that's that's kind of broad. We don't have. I think it's a fifth of an acre that the site is." <laughs> and uh, so we narrowed it down to, or I suggested narrow it down to Carolina native flora. Uh, even though if you're there, you may see something that snuck in from Texas or something like that. Uh, but, but I'm not gonna tell you where that is. You know, figure it out for yourself. Uh, we wanted to use sustainable landscape practices. So um, only portions of the gardens or uh, of this garden um, is irrigated. Um, we didn't want to use, uh, uh, we didn't want to start the garden out by having to uh, utilize a lot of fertilizer, those sort of things. And of course, we didn't want to use pesticides on the site. Um, and I'll get back to, to pests a little bit later. Um, and obviously, uh, talk about smart home landscape design, how to use uh, native plants in common homeowner landscape situations. Um, and then, uh, of course, we wanted to make it attractive. Uh, the gardens, uh, a, a good portion of the gardens are display gardens and people come there who may not be interested in, in plants at all. They just want to go to a, uh, a lovely place and be inspired, walk around and enjoy nature. Uh, just like Reedy Creek, but in a different way where uh, we actually have a, a, a large crew maintaining uh, those 10 acres, large crew, I shouldn't say that, uh, a, a crew of five and me. So that's, uh, let's see, that works out to two acres per, per person. <laughs> so, um, and then this was the uh, sort of the statement that Paula and Dr. Melichamp uh, came up with. Uh, as as sort of a um, what a dialogue of, of what we were uh, a statement of what we were planning to achieve, and so uh, again the talk the the, um, the title of the talk is challenging uh, challenges that one might face in uh, a native uh, plant garden. And so I'll, I'll kind of discuss these as we uh, go along. Um, and let's see, just want to make sure that, so after the site was uh, chosen, uh, I didn't get a chance to evaluate it. It was chosen for me. I don't think I would have chosen that particular <laughs> site uh, because of the challenges. One, it was on a slope. And then like I mentioned, the drainage was, um, and then there were, there were no, there were very few native plants on the site. Uh, a lot of them, most of them were exotic. If it had been a conifer garden that had uh, sort of aged out, as we say. Um, fortunately, it was sunny 
and then, like I said, the ditch that ran through the middle of the, the gardens. I mean, who, who would do that? Actually, what happened is the gardens e evolved around this uh, former ditch. And so I thought, well, the first thing that I should do is, um, you know, tackle that um, uh, part of the project. But I'll get back to that in a minute. But, so we decided, so they asked me, Paula and uh, Dr. Mellichamp asked me, well, how should we proceed and what sort of process would we, uh, would we go through? Uh, and Paula kept reminding Dr. Mellichamp, and those of you who know him would, would certainly understand, she said, now we don't want to influence the design too much. <laughs> and she was constantly uh, cutting him off when he would say, now, one of the things that we should do, and she'd say, Larry, no, no, uh, we're not going to influence the design. We're going um, we're going to sit back and just maybe make plant recommendations, which they did. And it was, uh, to be honest, uh, one of the best collaborations I've ever done in my career is working with two brilliant botanists and people that are just as passionate about plants as, as I am. So it was a great opportunity for me. Um, we all, so we started by gathering a group of people um, together, landscape professionals, some landscape architects, a landscape contractor, and then someone who knew a lot about uh, native plants, and this would be uh, Lisa Tompkins. Those of you, hopefully, you all know who Lisa Tompkins is. And uh, uh, Lisa made a suggestion in our, our group meeting discussion. We called it a charrette, had a design charrette. She said, well, I've been down to Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center, and one of the things that inspired me that I think we should consider is that uh, they have an area of the gardens there in Austin where different styles are, um, uh, different garden styles are represented in the gardens, but they only use native plants of Texas. And I thought, well, that's a brilliant idea because it kind of matches our mission of showing people what, uh, how to do things in their gardens. And most people in Charlotte don't have the same style of gardens. So it gives people an opportunity to see, like, let's just say, for example, you're in a Myers Park or a Ballantine garden uh, area, and you want to have a formal garden, not what some people think of as uh, a meadow uh, uh, that one would have in their front yard uh, and not be appropriate in those more formal manicured neighborhoods. And so uh, taking this um, uh, theme, and you, this is actually a photograph of uh, the formal garden uh, uh, in at the Labor Johnson Wildflower Center. Um, and that, that I took, I went down to visit, vi uh, visit it just to see for myself. And uh, it, it, was, it was quite inspiring. Um, so we came up with a plan. And um, you can see uh, the ditch was about here. Here's my, here's my dwarf pine. The crepe myrtle is up there. Um, and the ditch went right through here, right through the center. And so my concept that taking everyone else's, uh, everyone else's ideas was to uh, place a formal garden here that was a relatively flat uh, or an open slope, let me just put it that way, nothing was flat. And uh, then I moved, uh, I suggested that we move the string from here to here. That gave us a long strip to do a stream side meadow, which I probably shouldn't have used the word meadow uh, because it's not that large, it's more like a border. And then we had a, an opportunity to do a contemporary garden here. And then uh, Dr. Mellishap wanted a, a place for ferns. So that was there. Am I missing something? That pretty much covers. Oh, and then he wanted a Zurich uh, garden demonstration so that plants from the sand hills of the Carolinas 
could uh, could grow there. So that was our concept, and that was around 2013 that we uh, came up uh, with that. At the same time, we were clearing the site. So here's first thing we did was got rid of some dwarf Burford hollies. Don't don't get too sad. Uh, I know I know those of you who like Burford hollies, uh, but they had to go, of course. And then uh, uh, a little more than uh, a little less than ten years ago, we ended up with this look, where a lot of things have been chopped down, cleared of brush, and uh, so I had literally a blank slate to work with. Uh, oh, again, I need to point out. So our white pine is right down here, and some of the evergreen, uh, the conifers that we had on the site were uh, salvageable, and uh, part of our budget went to relocating. Uh, those to other parts of the gardens. And I'd say about 50 of them, 50% of them made it, which was good. And there's me and Dr. Mellichamp talking with the contractor. Uh, he was he was pretty confident that um, we were going in, a right, in the right direction. I don't think I slept well those first <laughs> days, first weeks, maybe I should say, because here we had, here's the old ditch, here, here's the new dish. And Paul and I would sort of talk to each other and say, uh, do we know this other ditch is going to work? And I said, I hope so. <laughs> so uh, anyway, you see the guy digging the ditch out now uh, or in that photograph. And then we used similar riprap, but with a lining on the bottom. And then that was how we finished that up. Um, and so again, looks very raw. You see our white pine there in the, in the center there. Um, and, and we grassed a lot of the using ryegrass uh, so that it wouldn't uh, give us issues down the road. There's that white pine again. Um, and that was, uh, that was also about 2012, probably uh, around uh, December and January, 2013. Then we had this uh, uh, spot that was very steep near the crepe myrtle. Again, I, I needed to preserve that. Uh, and if you're out there, you'll see why it's a, it's a very uh, a beautiful tree, even though it's not native. Um, and I came up with this idea of how to incorporate the tree, get a, a, a nice entrance, work with the slope. Uh, so I, uh, and I need to, needed to express to Paul and Larry, who couldn't visualize what I was thinking, how we would uh, pull all that off. And it was just a, a wooden deck that would um, would be sort of knitted around uh, new boulders that would come into the area. Uh, and I utilized a great source. Uh, those of you who have lived in Charlotte and have worked in gardening in Charlotte, will know that uh, we'll recognize the name Johnny Massingale of Ponders. He's done a lot of work with stones and uh, large stones. Uh, maybe I shouldn't say stones, maybe I should say boulders. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, it was a great ally in uh, collaborating with me. And he actually selected the stones. I gave him an idea of how large what our theme was going to be, and he brought in some uh, beautiful stones. And this is during, these are two photographs of the construction process of the, um, the deck. And you see he's, uh, the, uh, the carpenter here is working around uh, some of these large boulders that Johnny brought in. Again, not a lot of sleep those weeks, because here I was trying to coordinate two contractors who of different uh, disciplines, uh, but they work, work like a charm. Uh, Nathan Rose uh, was the carpenter on the deck and he did, had done a lot of work. If you've uh, been to the gardens, you'll, know, you'll uh, see that he's done a lot of the gate work and fence work around the Asian garden. Very talented, very talented. Uh, sort of more updated shots. This is uh, kind of how it looks currently. 
but right after uh, the work was done. So as we progress, this is uh, later on in 2018, uh, let me go back. We had just begun uh, setting up the planting beds. Of course, that's, that's once you get the uh, hardscape pretty much defined, uh, then you can set up your planting beds. Um, and so there's that white pine again to give you an idea. Uh, also, I want to point out, this was a, a second phase. Uh, it was either, I, I can't remember exactly why we phased it other than um, I guess I thought that if I screwed up on the first phase, <laughs> then I wouldn't be too far invested in this. I could leave town and <laughs> call it and Dr. Mellichamp wouldn't come uh, after me. Uh, but it, again, this was sort of, by doing it in stages, we were able to do a lot of the work ourselves. And at that time, there were only two gardeners. And so I couldn't ask them to uh, assist with a lot of the uh, planting. So we worked with volunteers. So our, what I'm saying is uh, the reason we stretched it out, there was no real rush to get the work done. Uh, as we got funds, donations, uh, grants, we did little by little, and then I ended up planting a considerable amount of the plants myself the first, um, uh, on the first phases. And this is one of the, uh, I don't know if y'all would recognize, Will Stewart is here, his wife is there somewhere. Uh, but they, uh, once September, I believe, uh, maybe that was September 2013, we had everything ready to, to have a, a planting session. And uh, so that's, how, that's another photograph of people in it. I just set out uh, uh, some of the native perennials <clears throat> to give an idea, uh, give them an idea of where to plant. Um, yeah, November 13th. So that's a photograph showing um, how things began to look the next year in the spring. You can see the, uh, the finished deck here and the, uh, the crepe myrtle tree, and then our uh, meadow, which is really a border. And things took off really well. Um, so we were excited about that. Um, Spigelia, especially um, uh, one of my favorite plants. This is a little bit later, but it shows you kind of how things grew up and, and, and changed. Uh, then our next project was the formal terrace, and that required uh, a lot of brickwork, and uh, which I, I had a lot of pictures of that construction going on, but I had to edit it out because it was getting a little long here. But, um, but again, trying to the intent here, this being the formal terrace, was to uh, provide some structure, uh, a more structured, symmetrical garden. Uh, these are Yopan hollies, a, a, a special one called Micron. Uh, and then these are an upright uh, Um uh, So uh, challenge me if you <laughs> if you don't agree. Um, and then we have uh, some wonderful um, Ilex winterberry hollies uh, in the two corners there, some Carolina phlox. Um, and so that's done very well. And, and if you have read Dr. Mellichamp's book, I think he makes a comment in there about St. Augustine grass he calls it native. So if he called it native, I was calling it native as well. <laughs> so we planted that. We found a uh, cultivar that was uh, more adapted to the cold called Raleigh. Um, and uh, again, my idea was to, with this theme, to uh, even though it was a brand new, uh, brand new walls and foundation uh, terrace, was to uh, give it a look of um, a period of the past so that uh, it would look like it had been there for a while. 
incorporating some grasses in there. And of course, you know, you got to have some. Uh, this is a uh, beach for sure. Uh, Coreopsis, which uh, did very well until bunnies came in. That's part of the challenge. Now, it, so I'll, I'll take this opportunity to tell you that when you're you know, in your program, when you say you want a native garden to benefit wildlife, <laughs> think about that, uh, because it did really bring in the wildlife. So we have an overpopulation right now of bunnies, and mm -hmm. we have learned real quickly that uh, bunnies love a lot of things that are, um, uh, that are native. So um, we have to be, we have to uh, edit what we replant. Flocks, unfortunately, is one of those things that they love. Asters. We had gorgeous Georgia asters the first uh, couple of uh, late summers, and now they're totally obliterated um, uh, by the bunnies. But we've got some very healthy bunnies. So. <laughs> You know, maybe we could rename it the Bunny Guard, Mellichamp Bunny Guard. I don't know. We'll figure something out. Um, but th this shows you uh, different seasons uh, from the previous being fall or late summer uh, in the winter because we have visitors during the winter as well. And similar to what homeowners have, you don't want to have a one season or two season. Uh, garden, you want something interesting all year round. So we incorporated some of the native evergreens, which are not that many. Uh, some of the, um, the the junipers, or as we call them in South, cedars, but they're not really cedars. But junipers, the boulders, <coughs> the other hardscape kind of keeps those, uh, keeps a structure there in the design so that the grasses can be more free flowing and you don't, it doesn't look uh, terribly cha chaotic. Um, uh, here's uh, mountain mint, which is great for pollinators. Uh, this was, uh, I defied Dr. Mellichamp's request not to put that in there <laughs> because he said it will take over. Well, actually, this is the mountain mint is behind. This is um, uh, Monara punctata, the horse mint. And the pollinators. Uh, uh, maybe just as a slang way of saying it, it was like bee crack. It was just like crack for bees. They loved it. And then, of course, uh, Dr. Mellichamp uh, requested that we put these two plants together, the nodding onion, allium serenum, serenum, something like that with a C, uh, along with the uh, butterfly bee. And they do make a great combination because they bloom about the same time, They're very complementary. Also, the rattlesnake master, which has a terrible name, but a great, um, great form. We're going to have to figure out uh, a way to keep the bunnies out of that because they will, they will, they have kept almost completely destroyed all the uh, uh, the rattlesnake master in in the gardens, mm -hmm. even the little little things, little ones that because they will reseed and move around the gardens, but th th they've taken care of it. And well, you know, under this this uh, uh, grouping of plants is great. You may see some eyes in there, and some little ears, some little bunny tail. <laughs> they love they love living up under those uh, perennials. Yes, you know why why not? It's, it keeps keeps them away, yeah. keeps them hidden from the predators, and there's food right there. It's just like you know, fast food. Um, these are more recent photos. I wanted to um, how are we doing the time? I'm not seeing much. Good. No, we're good. Okay. Um, so uh, I want to talk a little bit about color and go through some of. Um, uh, some of the rest of the areas of the gardens. Uh, I'll point out if the next garden we did was a contemporary called Temp Contemporary Terrace. And that was where I wanted to sort of push the envelope uh, and do something very interesting with design. You see the stone um, 
somebody help me with the, the name, not Gabians, or Gabians, people call it, where it's just uh, a, a structural, um, sculptural element, is what I meant to say. And doesn't form any function, except it does provide a separation between the two different styles of gardens. Uh, this is Yopan Holly. Uh, please don't throw any uh, rotten tomatoes or anything at me because I do like native bars. Um, and this is one of my favorites, mainly because it was um, selected and registered by a nursery in Seneca, South Carolina, near where I grew up. And I know the, um, the owners of uh, Headley Nursery, Bob Head and Bill Head, brothers, uh, they found this and patented it. It's called Hoggy. I was calling it Hoggy, but uh, Dr. Mellichamp brought in Bob Head one day and I said, I love this plant. Uh, it's Hoggy is great. Hoggy is Hoggy. <laughs> like, oh, okay. He didn't, didn't crack a smile or anything. It didn't. So I was very embarrassed and Dr. Mellichamp just sort of shook his head. Yeah. yeah. So he was, I, I hope he was glad that we were using his plant in the native garden. But you can see in this kind of dark slide that that color pops out. And this is a good complement with the cor uh, Coriopsis and the Rubeckias that are, are blooming at that time of year. So this is uh, the early stages of the contemporary terrace. I wanted to use concrete. There are the Gabian Gabians or Gabians before they're filled with stone to give you an idea. Uh, at the opening, we didn't, um, we had a little bit of a mess up from the fabricator and they didn't get them to us until the day before the opening, which was really stressful for me. So um, we went ahead and put them up, but didn't put the stone in. Uh, until several weeks later. Um, so this is, uh, and people call them the, are, what are those bear cages? <laughs> so uh, this is what it looked like in the uh, beginning. I wanted uh, sort of a regular uh, contemporary look and planters, uh, concrete walls instead of using uh, brick. Uh, so that's as it's matured using a lot of native grasses. Um, this is Panicum Wind Dancer. I can't remember the species, but the genus is Panicum and the cultivar is Wind Dancer. And um, it, I don't know if I would, well, it was great here in this situation, but now it has moved downhill and it, uh, it, it's growing in other places, but which is fine. I've, I've been able to uh, edit it out or tolerate it, whatever, whatever you want to say. So, uh, but working the, again, working with the loose freeform grasses and the very dense uh, Yopan hollies was sort of a theme through the whole project, which uh, is an element that is used a lot in uh, English garden design. If you look at their perennial borders where they have a lot of color and freeform plants, the way that they um, keep the gardens from looking chaotic is having one or two um, evergreens that are very tightly manicured. Mm -hmm. And Yopan holly, or at least the dwarf Yopan hollies, are very easy to keep compact. Uh, we share these maybe three or four times a, a year. And, and I don't do it anymore. Uh, uh, one of the gardeners loves to do that um, for us. Here's more of the micron, which is also a Yopan holly, but very even smaller leaf and much more tight. Um, and a good plant to use, except it's not super cold tolerant. So if it gets down in the single digits and temperatures, uh, we should probably, we will probably cover it with a sheet or something like that. And then the other issue is uh, the garden is not lit at night. And when, uh, uh, hopefully I'm not offending anyone by saying uh, uh, a drunken frat uh, gentleman <laughs> walk through the gardens at night and happen to stumble 
we can see their imprint in, in the Yopon hollies <laughs> because if you've grown them, you know, they're very brittle. Yes. And I'll, I'll, I'll get a text from one of the gardeners with a holding a whole uh, series of branches and say, I think somebody was walking through the gardens last night. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So, the gardens are closed at night, by the way. So, uh, just, just to let you know. But again, uh, trying to come up with different themes uh, and enticing our visitors to, to want to use uh, native plants was, was the intention from the beginning. And again, I had a lot of support from Paula and Dr. Mellochamp in. Uh, working with these different styles after they realized that the garden, the first phase was going to live and work, they let me uh, move, move ahead with a little more confidence. So, and then we had the garden opening, I think that was 2019. There's Larry and, and uh, Audrey there um, at the opening. Um, and then uh, my family surprised me and came in for the opening. I didn't know they were coming. So they were there as well. Um, I don't have pictures of them, but um, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was a time of celebration uh, for everyone. Um, and we're very excited to have named it after Larry. So I throw this photograph up uh, again check the time don't want to go over uh, yeah um, being a landscape architect and then I also have a bachelor of fine arts in painting from UNC Charlotte um, I you know if somebody I, I was a kid in school if you gave me this box I was very disappointed I wanted all <laughs> 64 colors at the time there was only 64 I don't know how many there are now um, but and then of course the built-in sharpener on the side was, was great because I would color a lot so um, and the same way with plants uh, in order to uh, get contrast interest excite our visitors to use native plants I wanted to, um, again, somebody's going to be throwing things at me in a minute, but I, I really think that if we look at the native R's, the uh, cultivated natives that are available to us, we uh, can reasonably use, we should think about, we should consider using them in our gardens. Um, there are some issues, and those of you who know um, uh, coneflower, that the coneflowers that have the modified the double blooms that bees don't aren't very attracted to. I mean, why have it if it's not going to be beneficial for wildlife? Um, now, it does make good bunny food. We don't have any, <laughs> any uh, coneflower in the gardens because they, they wipe that out first. So just keep that in mind. Here's this panicum. I, I go back and forth. Sorry for digressing. But here's the panicum. I didn't plant this. It planted itself there. Uh, but it looks fine. So I left it. And uh, it, it actually likes it better in this gravel than it does on the hill where I planted it. So, you know. <laughs> Um, and then this mist flower, these photographs were taken uh, a couple of days ago. And this mist flower, the, the image, it's not that blue for those of you who know mist flower. Um, and, but it, um, it also moves around and has moved around with the, uh, the panicum, uh, um, North, uh, not North wind, what, what was I saying, uh, wind dancer. We do have uh, north wind. This is north wind here. It's more vertical. But you can see a better, uh, closer shot of the hoggy, uh, 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 sort of light colored. Hoggy. <laughs> <Hoggy. laughs> How is it spelled? H O G Y. Hoggy. Like. You know, but it's hoggy. He says I would have put two G's in it, but maybe it came from I didn't ask him after being embarrassed, uh, mispronouncing it. But anyway, you look you look that up online, and it says 
are registered for a patent by um, Bob Head. Mm. So it's, it's interesting. Um, some other colorful plants. Uh, so we can't always have flowers in, in the gardens, especially our natives, unless we only use uh, our strict, not only, but mostly use uh, perennials, which again, I've got a funny problem. So I'll try to use plants that uh, in the gardens and replace those that are rabbit fodder uh, with plants that have uh, color and interest all year round. Uh, the yucca has been also one of those. Uh, this one may be color guard, I think. Um, again, not. I don't know if you could find that in um, in nature. Someone did, of course, but. Um, <clears throat> Uh, that's not the one that you would see uh, in a native landscape. Uh, here's the mountain mint used with the grasses. You see how tight this is. This is more loose. Uh, a little spider there, but it is covered in all kind of insects um, during the uh, when when the flowers are blooming. Um, you, you you could I don't think you could count the number of the variety of insects besides the domesticated honeybees to uh, four or five different kinds of bumblebees, uh, different kinds of flies. Uh, it's fascinating just to stand there and, um, and look at the bees and watch visitors come in and say, the bees, the bees, you know, <laughs> because there's so many of them. And what was that plant called? Uh, that one is called mountain net. But mountain net. yeah, but remember, as Dr. Melchamp says, you're going to be pulling it out of areas. And we have a volunteer, Sarah, who is devoted to her job is to take care of the mountain net once a year. She pulls it out from around rocks and, and invades into, she's like, you know, she's, she's our specialist and she loves eradicating the, the border. So you have to keep it in bounds. Uh, a two by six works well, a treated two by six. Uh, uh, if you have some extra laying around, uh, but you have to plant it deep because it'll it'll send up runners. It's just like any other mint. Uh, it does have a mint smell to the leaves. A uh, closer view of the Monarda punctata, and then uh, um, some of the uh, little blue stem uh, uh, combined with other plants at different times of years. Uh, a, a very interesting plant that I never knew anything about until Dr. Melichamp introduced it uh, to me, from he had picked up a, pint, a little uh, quart pot at a nursery in Anderson, South Carolina. Uh, the common name is uh, dwarf pussy toes, mm -hmm. and it's Antonaria neglecta or virginica. We've had debates on which it is. So uh, I like the, the name neglecta because you just sort of leave it alone. <laughs> this patch doesn't ex the the solid patch doesn't exist anymore because um, uh, I think we overwatered it. So it, it takes some skill. It, it wants to grow uh, where there are rock edges. And so it, it likes these it's sort of uh, interesting uh, uh, cultivated area that is not full sun, not too much water, but just enough. And then at Colorway, I should, should have, I, I took a photograph, but I didn't include it. They used the uh, genus Antenaria, uh, now I can't remember the species, Plantagenea, uh, as a ground cover in a parking lot at, um, at uh, Colorway. Uh, and that was amazing to, to see that. Uh, unfortunately, these flowers only last like a, a week and then they start to turn brown. And, and look rough, but um, the, you don't see that many ground covers that thrive. I, and just to remind you, or just to, to sort of uh, re-express the point, I got a quart. And so I moved this around in different places in the gardens. The other thing um, to, to, to spread it around. Um, the other thing is we tried to propagate it for our plant sales doesn't like to grow in pots, maybe because it's too wet. Mm -hmm. And even though you stick signs on the uh, 
in the pots to say, do not water. Somebody, people, some, uh, sometimes people in the gardens don't read. <laughs> and uh, so um, anyway, so that's it. I wanted to save a little bit of time to uh, answer some questions. And I want to, uh, before I, if I forget in the wrap up, um, I want to invite you out to the Botanical Gardens to see this and other parts of the gardens. And for those of you who haven't been, I was talking with someone earlier, hadn't been there in 10 years. Well, I've been there in 10 years. Uh, I've been there for 10 years. And my job is to take our collection and make it really shine. Dr. Mellichamp has come in uh, or, or preceded me in uh, bringing all of these unusual plants and now native plants. Uh, and it's my job to feature them and make them look uh, great in a well-designed landscape. So um, hopefully you'll see some difference between a collection, the collection and a well um, curated uh, display garden of plants. And if you see me or any of my gardeners, now I have five. I went from two to five. Um, if you see any of us out, we are there to uh, answer questions. And if you don't see any of us, any of us, we have a staff page. You can send us emails and uh, make inquiries that way. And if you're taking photographs of a plant, say, what is this plant? Please take, like Dr. Melchamp says, five or six close up, far back, leaves, flowers, so that we can identify the plants uh, better. Uh, there's been many times when uh, uh, I've shown him a picture of a leaf and he said, well, that does me no good. That could be any number of things. <laughs> I, need, I need five or six pictures. So again, tribute to Dr. Mellichamp and uh, his great work and um, what a great mentor. And I, I just, uh, I'm the luckiest person in the world that had, uh, had my experience with him. So anyway, uh, questions, someone back here. Yeah. Did Professor Miller say I'll squeeze in if I never explain? Not in this garden because um, we have a special area in the courtyard that is watered daily and has more of an intense um, uh, maintenance regimen. And so he was very particular about, uh, I. We, we talked about it and discussed it, but we were trying to figure out how we were going to keep the soil damp and mimic the natural environment. And would it make sense to do that when we already had a display at the greenhouse and we just never, never did that. And we, we don't have a, a lot of room, but maybe, maybe someday. I know it, it, if you've ever been to the South Carolina Botanical Gardens in uh, Clemson, they have a very interesting uh, display, which is kind of self-watering. Uh, but you know, there there are a lot of engineers there, and they like to figure out stuff. But I'm not sure. It's not very natural, but uh, they do have um, uh, pitcher plants and and um, Venus flytraps in one area of their meadows. So it's kind of up in a planter. So it's very interesting. Next question. Yes. I was interested in the um, creek that you moved or the water runoff. Right. That's not natural, right? It was the runoff from. Yeah. Okay. And then um, do you, did you line it with some impervious or impervious and is it still lined out? Um, what we did, um, again, everything there was an experiment. Uh, and because it drained the entire parking lot and it, I went out several times before we did any adjustment to see how much water came through there. And, and if, you, if you can kind of visualize uh, Charlotte storms, a lot of water hitting pavement, going into the storm system, and then this drain dumping out, it's like a fire hose, but this big around, mm -hmm. into a ditch uh, with nothing slowing it down, uh, and, and also pitched. Uh, it gained speed. Um, uh, I was very concerned about uh, uh, it washing out that area. 
So again, using the riprap, which was affordable, which I didn't didn't like initially, and uh, then like you like you were asking, the liner was um, just a landscape fabric that was pervious. It wasn't black plastic, um, but a a black pervious uh, filter filter fabric. Uh, I can't think of the other names that it was called, but a, a landscape fabric. Uh, and those st stones were set on top of that so that there would be, what, what it did actually was it kept the, the force of the water from underwashing those uh, larger, those riprap stones. So it stayed on top, the stones slowed down that water and it also kept the soil right where the water was. It kept that stable and we pinned it. Uh, and then I don't know in one of the photographs you remember seeing the uh, cellulose fiber, the wood fiber that was on the outside as a temporary measure uh, so that we could pull that back and plant once the, uh, the bank had uh, established a little bit better and until some of the mountain mint had established. Once that mountain mint established, we had no problems with <laughs> soil moving around. And then because of the aesthetic issue with the riprap, we later came in, because I just, I didn't like looking at it. I asked if we could have a couple of uh, pallets of river rock that was like this. And I placed them, I spent several days placing them within the riprap so it didn't look so bad. Mm -hmm. Now you can barely see, because everything's grown up, mm -hmm. you can barely see the stone. And so the plants have filled in, I mean, it's been 10 years. Um, the plants have grown in, established uh, their own uh, filter fabric sort of thing. And especially the mountain mint. Uh, so so are, am I understanding that eventually the plants that got established put down roots that were able to cope with the inundation of water? Right, okay. right. But it's really more of the water. They were so well established, the water, uh, wa it did, the water had no effect on them. They made a, a nice tight right. mat. And uh, we used, uh, that was one of the ones that I used close by the, scouring area and then the other was river oats which i would not these, those are both very somewhat invasive plants let's just say uh not like kudzu that would be very um and uh we did, did have some washouts here and there but because this was not a one and done project it was we got to i uh any area that was scoured out i went back and repaired and added uh, more stone or stabilize the stone in some way. So now it's completely stabilized. We don't get any problems now. But watching, you know, next week we'll have this <laughs> tsunami <laughs> and I'll be eating my words. So, anyway. yes, question over here. Um, this is a native plant. Is this one that we can extract? Or, yeah. Take, take off? I think the general practice uh, uh, with builders, there's there are requirements to use native plants. So you will see, unless it's a, um, so there's two different kinds of ponds. There's detention where it slowly filters into the system and then retention where it's retained and sits for a longer time. Um, ours was a detention and we really weren't trying to get it into the aquifer as much as we were, uh, the underground aquifer, uh, as much as we were trying to slow it down to keep our garden from washing away. So um, yes, there's, you know, there's all, uh, I believe the county and the city have lists that of plants that are available and uh, you heard me refer to Paula. Mm -hmm. Paula's husband works for an organization, HARP, H-A-R-P. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much what they do uh, is they will establish, uh, reestablish uh, creek banks with natural material. 
And one of the reasons that we have more native plants now is because these government agencies, I know a lot of you don't like big government, but the requirements are to use native plants in these, um, what am I trying to say, these uh, riparian mm -hmm. areas where they have, instead of, we have an area at UNCC that flooded and was pretty much a straight uh, ditch that went through tennis court areas and athletic fields. Now that has been uh, modified and actually Harp was doing that work and I took the gardeners over to meet. Uh, and maybe Mallard Creek's sewer expansion, all that was together. And so um, anyway, the, he, they were called in because they're specialists in acquiring those plants, native plants. Uh, most of them come with certification that they're native. So that when they uh, provide a bid or they, they're a subcontractor to the main contractor, then they have to provide documentation that it came from a certified nursery in the state. So if it's, if it's a big public project, you can always count on, well, you should count. <laughs> Let me say, I'm not an inspector. You should count on those being native plants. If it's a private developer, it may depend on the, the inspector on, on the project and how strict the inspector is on a city project. But in neighborhoods, uh, uh, larger neighborhoods, I think the larger the project, the more strict things are. So uh, if you're not sure that a plant is native, you can always send it to us and we'll get it around it. Uh, again, remember five or six pictures though. Uh, and, and we will identify it as whether or not it's native or, or not. Yes, question. Does your uh, ditch drain into a, a creek? Yes, a... yes. It drains into uh, the gardens. The main reason the gardens was developed is because the university didn't develop the uh, stream area. And it floods. Maybe the next presentation I can do is on flooding. And you can watch these uh, uh, crazy videos of the water rising from just a trickle to five, six feet, because the university was grandfathered in and developed before uh, the county and city came in and made restrictions. They are changing some things, but it's, uh, there are days when I think, well, this is the end of the gardens. Uh, and I have videos uh, to prove it, mostly parking decks uh, our, our, our nemesis, uh, the one that is right next to uh, where Miss Bonnie Cohn is, is uh, buried. And uh, so I just hope Miss Bonnie uh, stays put and isn't washed away. Uh, and I'm serious. <laughs> that sounds like a joke, but one of these days I just worry, like, oh no, it's going to make the headlines. So anyway, questions over here still? Um, when you're planting into uh, clay, Yes. Uh, that's a very good question. Um, even though they're native plants, uh, not, they don't always love our native clay. And that's because our native clay may be subsoil and um, the topsoil has been removed. So the easiest thing for us was to, in our situation, was to get uh, loads of city compost and integrate that into the native soil so that it loosens that clay up. Um, and I didn't go down real deep. So it, actually, the, I learned a lesson. The soil was too, too rich because we didn't, we, we over, over budgeted what we needed. Let's just put it that way. And so, um, you know, if you're doing it as a homeowner, if it's half and half, like if you've got a, you know, a three gallon hole, uh, put half of it as compost and, and return some of the clay back, unless it's really heavy clay or you've got different conditions like you're planting azaleas, things like that. And everything is planted high. Mm -hmm. And when I'm planting, um, we have had some issues at UNCC where our camellias and some of our azaleas are stunted because Dr. Mellichamp was not out there watching when the planting was done. And, uh, and my gardeners give me a hard time about uh, 
the plants are sitting up out of the grounds, roots exposed and, you know, sort of sideways, but I'd rather do that than, than uh, bury them too deep. So I actually leave them an inch, uh, a minimum of an inch out of the ground to pull some soil up around mm -hmm. the plants. So that's another thing I practice. Other question, yes. Um, so when I saw the use of a yucca plant in the landscaping, I cringed. I just I moved into a house, I've only been there 18 months. Uh -huh. And the previous landscape feature was yucca. <laughs> <laughs> and we're talking under the driveway. Uh -huh. I mean, it's everywhere. I'm, I know there are tons of varieties of these things, but is there definitely one that's less invasive because this is a nightmare? <laughs> yeah. Well, just like any anything else, and that, there are some that are uh, more invasive than others. The uh, I'll give you an example. The contemporary terrace used to be uh, well, it was it was a slope, and I made it into more of a flat terrace. Uh, and so the area uh, that we covered up with five, four or five feet of soil um, was, I guess it's more like three to four feet of soil, um, had yucca below it that I removed, I thought. Mm -hmm. And then it would sprout up through four feet of soil. Wow. And then we continued. So what we did was we just took the opportunity, like nothing will grow over here. Let's plant a yucca. <laughs> so we remove it, and now we were using a species that is either filamentosa or similar to filamentosa, not the real, but we couldn't have the, uh, what's another name for it, sword? Um, Spanish bayonet. There you go. Thank you. Yeah, not Spanish bayonet. We don't have, we can't have those at UNCC because liability, but yucca <laughs> filamentosa is a little less prickly and we haven't had any uh, lawsuits about that one <laughs> but the, you will see yucca all over the gardens um what and what another thing that we do even with the ones that we want to keep is when it gets monstrous because it will get large um and and we're talking about sun or shade our sun and shade um we cut it back all the way back to the ground and then it comes back in much more tame and concentrated. But yeah, you you can just, you know, if you don't like it, then you can always uh, put a little herbicide on it. I'm not advocating doing that, but you know, or we did try to plant it, it didn't. Yeah. It didn't. Okay, maybe Yeah, we tried a lot. So yeah, if you uh, it, maybe you could have a, a a neighborhood sale, and this is the plant that will grow anywhere. Where? We're talking the roots of these things. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. The flowers yeah. are beautiful. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> they are. And guess what? Bunnies won't eat them. So <laughs> you know, we're, we're, it may be a total yucca garden by the time uh, I retire. So yes, question back here. Um, what do you suggest? Or, um, shade planting, native shade. Native shade. So um, there are quite a few things. One, uh, if you, the first one on the list would be um, uh, Elysium, I L O I C I U M, anise tree and a shrub. It's in Dr. Bella Champ's book. Uh, because it does so well, uh, uh, nurserymen are finding new cultivars, varieties. <coughs> Again, I meant to put it in my presentation, but we were at a nursery picking up plants for the plant sale, and the nurserymen down there had been given a, um, uh, a piece of uh, an anise that was found that was absolutely beautiful, white and green streaked, variegated, and was growing in the wild. So, in other words, he didn't, he was able to make a patent on it because it was discovered in the wild instead of, you know, in someone's uh, field. So, um, yeah, we're going to have more and more of the um, Florida sunshine is, is one that I am planting in my garden, uh, but I learned at the Natives Terrace, you can't plant it in the sun like some of the other 
ants. And there's, they're, like I said, different species. Uh, the best resource would be to look at Dr. Melchamp's book and uh, read up about it because he's got some great stories. And again, deer proof. My mom's uh, my mom gets herds of deer coming through her yard, but the they don't touch the anise. It's just if you've ever mashed uh, the leaves, mm -hmm. it smells just like licorice or yeah. anise. Yeah. Um, it's it's poisonous though, right? For kids and pets. Uh, possibly, but uh, you know. That's what kept me from that because it yeah. looks beautiful. Yeah. And it smells good. But um you you know, um then you're limited with with other things that are poisonous. So I, I think double check your research on the amount of poison mm -hmm. uh so that like there are some ferns that would work well in shade, but they're poisonous. Azaleas mm -hmm. are somewhat toxic. So you know. Uh, look at the, I think there is a website, especially for North Carolina, that mm -hmm. says slightly poisonous, yes. very toxic. Mm -hmm. And then a good idea is to uh, explain to children not to eat those things. <laughs> uh, or someone would say, uh, so getting back to Dr. Melochamp, is someone would say, well, can you eat this? And he would say, sure. But you might not like it. You know, <laughs> so I, uh, that's a line that I like. Are we We've need got, to wrap it well, up? We've got a few questions on. Oh yeah, sure. Let me go. So someone asked, um, is there any software that you use or recommend for mapping out a garden? If you're mm. having something like that. No, unfortunately not. That that is a big uh, a big issue, and uh, I could again I could do a whole another presentation on that. Being a landscape architect. It's been a big challenge uh, to uh, help people with design. I taught a design class. It's marginally successful. I, I, I really uh, get the impression that people aren't, you know, just a one hour class or two hour class is not uh, helpful. We, we need to get out there and advocate for more professionals uh, to uh, join the Native Plant Society design professionals to join the plant society and become active and be those instruments that help us to uh, do the designs. Uh, one of the reasons that I started working for the uh, botanical gardens is because that is, that's a tough, tough industry because uh, you 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 work a lot and then you, you don't hear from people and you don't you don't get clients for months and then you you know you start getting calls from the the, the the, the bill companies, the utilities, and say, I, you need to pay us. And then, then you may get some. So it's, it's just up, what I'm saying is up, up and down mm -hmm. sort of thing. So, and, and uh, in the industry, it's not uh, a well paid profession. So, designers, uh, unfortunately, uh, the value of gardeners and talented designers is not uh, rewarded. So there's no, um, there are very few landscape designers that do uh, do well, um, and so that's why I'm at the botanical garden. So I, you know, I just couldn't make a living doing that. But uh, the software, getting back to the software, you can buy design programs, but there are, uh, to my knowledge, none that work. They're just a waste of money. But if there is some, please, somebody, please contact me because I've got the same problem. I have to do everything by hand and by sketch. Uh, and you, you may have seen one of the sketches that I did for Dr. Melichamp and Paula, but um, we are trying to map the gardens and are struggling with that. We've got a pro whole program at UNCC that is a GIS specialty. And uh, we we because we are so behind in the mapping we can't even uh get it so uh it's it's a problem i know but uh the best thing is just to experiment and work and, and uh, trudge along and make mistakes and move things around like i do <laughs> there's another question on there yep. about um keeping native landscapes from looking you know messy is yes. what people say that they're notorious for yep. so any like general maintenance tips or suggestions yeah, uh, let's see. So, um, you know, one of the things would be to uh, come to UNCC and volunteer and see 
how we learn to do it, it's it's been it's been a lot of work, hasn't it? Learning how to keep things uh, natural. It, it's it's this odd balance where it's 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 very. Um, uh, I'm saying this right, subjective. Yeah, subjective as to what it looks good and what doesn't. And most of our native plants are not meant to look good by themselves, unless you're looking at uh, some of Lisa Tompkins' um, wonderful Instagram pictures, which she <laughs> has great, great photographs uh, of native plants. But then, you know, unless you have huge swaths, they, things don't look good. And then you have issues with they only look good for a short period of time. So getting back to the question, the general rule is to uh, see if you can find it and come to the botanical gardens and see what a uh, provide some planting structure. Again, using the Yopon hollies, the sheared plants, which again, uh, what, I, what our objective was there is to show homeowners that uh, if you want a neater look, you're going to have to pick one or two plants that you <clears> shear <throat> or prune carefully and uh, keep very neat in order to provide a background or structure for those loose plants to work with it. So they pop up in it. And again, it's, it's, it's not something that I invented, but something the English gardeners do with their perennials uh, and their perennial borders. Where they're trying to get all this color and then they have but they have a constant in there which may be the evergreens or the prune boxwood that kind of uh let the eye rest and and beautiful lawns which we don't like lawns so that would be for the english not for us so anyway um hopefully that answered the question a little bit uh, one other one um the uh Sorry, the issue that people are saying they run into a lot is just that they can't find natives in a whole lot of nurseries. Are there any places around here that you'd recommend that tend to have a big selection? Or Well, and I think one of the issues, too, is I mean, that's definitely a problem, but also the volume. Like, if you are a landscaper or trying to do a bigger project, like finding a neighbor is probably an issue with chat. Yeah, so um, in my lifetime, um, I would say, don't worry about don't worry about this because in my lifetime the amount of natives available. Remember, I'm the the person that likes to work with the whole box of crayons, a large box of crayons instead of the little one. Um, they're available in big box stores. You just have to look and you have to do your own research because remember these are national companies that say native, but they may be native to California. So um, do your research. If you need uh, information on if they're native to the Carolinas or the Southeast, there are a lot of resources. Again, Dr. Mellichamp's book, uh, he's, it's a, I didn't have that resource years ago to work with. I had to uh, go to the library. I know this is before the internet. Uh, I am that old. Uh, and I, I had to go to the library and look these plants up. Now you can go to the internet and see where it's native to. And then there's uh, a website called BONAP, B-O-N-A-P, uh, which is biological something, something. I should know what those letters mean. But you can look up and see maps of where these plants are native uh, and what counties they're native to. So, um, you know, that resource exists online for free. Um, getting back to the question, um, a lot of the nurseries in Charlotte um, have a good selection of natives and the independent nurseries, not the big box stores, are very good about uh, giving you instruction on what is native. I mean, that's what they're, that's why they're better than the big box stores. As you can say, I'm interested in native plants. Can you point out a few? Or you can uh, make a list from Dr. Mellichamp's book and go to the nurseries and say, do you have these? Or go to websites. Um, some of the nurseries that I would recommend, 
uh, our Ross farms, if you're looking for native perennials, um, they, uh, and they grow for large uh, landscape projects. They will have, uh, and they have large, good looking plants. Uh, we buy for them, buy from them for our projects. Ross Farms is in South Charlotte uh, and uh, uh, quite a great operation, mainly because they sell wholesale to uh, landscapers and then they sell also retail for other uh, for customers that is it's pretty amazing to be able to do that. Uh, other uh, landscape companies, uh, landscape nurseries like Dearness, they have uh, great knowledgeable employees that will lead you to native uh, plants. So I suggest that you, you do that. Uh, and the, the, the first answer should have been, you should have been at our plant sale yesterday <laughs> and the day before that, and even better, become a member on the first day so that the natives aren't wiped out because people would come into the sale and, and if I caught them, they would say, show me where the native plants are. And so much more demand. It's this, you know, sort of demand, what, what do they call it? The demand versus, uh, you know, you, if, supply and demand. If you grow it, if, if it will sell, the growers will grow it. It's sort of this, which came first, the chicken and the egg. And so, uh, anyway, so people are demanding the natives. So compared to, uh, several years ago, I won't tell my age, several years ago when we <clears throat> couldn't do that. Now you, uh, you have this fantastic selection and also being promoted by the Native Plant Society. Uh, people are even, are even aware of natives. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So email Linda Tompkins. Um, you know, she she has some probably a lot more unusual plants. Um, there is uh, uh, a nursery in Asheville, Carolina natives that you, you have to be careful uh, because. Uh, of the what we call provenance because that's at a higher and cooler uh, climate than ours, but you still can find some things that will work in the Piedmont if you do your research well. Um, but again, the local nurseries are doing a very good job in my estimation compared to what it was 35 or so years ago. We have a listing on our page too of some yeah, on the, oh, that's right, yeah, yeah. sure do. So again, good for the people who aren't aware of this, uh, as Laura mentioned, uh, go to the Native Plant Society's website and uh, a lot of the nurseries, um, you know, we, we certainly want to support them. So uh, they're listed. So, and you can also email uh, us at the Botanical Gardens. I'm, my email is on the web page. Uh, and uh, certainly with our native uh, plant uh, certification courses, we want to support those businesses as well. So uh, please email us and if you have those questions. And any questions that I'm not able to answer within the time today, uh, shoot me a quick email. It, it is plant sale season, so it may take me a while to get back to you, uh, but... Um, please email me and if you have questions and come visit the gardens. Again, that's where you get, that's where you get the information. That's what we're there for. The Reedy Creek, uh, Native Plant Society, we're there to educate the public. Uh, so come out to these resources that are available to you and, and most of them are free. Can you stick around for a few minutes to answer any questions? Yes. Yeah, they're awesome. We're going to uh, do a raffle, so we'll say goodbye to the people yeah. online. Well, a big thank you to Ed for coming out. Thank today. you for having me. I appreciate uh, it. Thank you to everybody who came. Thank you for everybody on the Zoom that joined us today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and end the Zoom meeting and then do the raffle here. So thank you it very much. It would be fun to be that came in that did not get raffle tickets.